Thank, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for giving us an overview on the atrial fibrillation, right from the epidemiology on to the management. I think uh, we are actually seeing an aging population now. And as he rightly pointed out, you know, once you, somebody touches the age of 80 years, it's perhaps as high as about 10 percent. And even uh, not only that, I think another area is heart failure. So I think uh, we've been doing some work, and then we've seen that this is really climbing up. Close to about 10 percent of patients now develop AF. And that's indeed a very, very challenging situation. Sometimes you have a patient with uh, significant heart failure on various drugs, and then at this point of time, to tackle this and also to control the rate as well as the rhythm becomes even more, more difficult. Uh, my question is, uh, um, uh, are we really, I mean, uh, the, the diagnosis being really, really uh, that uh, easily followed in the general pop, I mean, at least in the general physician's level, is being really, is it being picked up? Um, I mean, sometimes we say that an EKG can really bring out this diagnosis, but then time and again we have seen com patients coming to you quite late in the, in the, in the course of the disease. So I think what, what could be done in the, in the current era of smart for phones and smart watches, I think it's e easier, I mean, done than said about it. Uh, what, what is your message to the physicians in this, from this perspective? Well, I think uh, it's, it's very clear that a lot of atrial fibrillation, whether it is paroxysmal, uh, uh, is, is missed in, in, in many of these patients. They present with heart failure, they present with stroke. So clearly there's been a period where they could have been picked up, they could have been anticoagulated or managed at that point in time before they reach this critical or, or even tachycardiomyopathy. Again, you see these patients come with LV uh, dysfunction. They are in AF, AF at this point, and you're not sure whether they were, uh, if they were picked up early enough, many of these could have been prevented. So uh, I think this is a huge challenge. But I think with uh, a, a, a fair amount of public education by engaging with physicians, I think we should be able to at least sensitize them to the fact that AF is, is something that needs to be looked at. And with the smartwatches that are available today, I think this is going to be the way forward is what I would feel. Maybe, uh, Sybil, you could uh, add on to that. In the Smartwatches are an excellent tool. and. The newest technology on smartwatches already give such a good quality on ECG that you can nicely differentiate the distinguished P waves. So uh, you can nicely see, is it an atrial tachycardia, is it a uh, um, flutter, is it atrial fibrillation? So it's not like a couple of years ago where we just looked, okay, there are QRS complexes, they're irregular, should be AF, but uh, time changed. And I think this is honestly the future. But there's also something else. Um, this is also for the physician more work. Every physician will get in future maybe in their Outlook account hundred thousands of online ECGs uh, which we have to look up in future. But however, for the patient it's good. Uh, uh, if I can just add a question here. What about the AF burden? I mean, what would you start, when would you start worrying? Somebody comes to you saying, okay, I've got a 30 second AF. Is that, is that something that worries you or if somebody says, I've got a two-minute AF? Where would you start worrying? Okay, um, this question has been answered in these guidelines nicely. Um, we talk about AF after 30 seconds. So um, before we had um, different definitions in the last 10 years, some pacemaker guys guidelines said, okay, six minutes, irregularities, or whatever, then we talk about AF. But you asked me personally when I get worried and when I would take any action to treat the patient. Um, we have couple of data in the last, uh, we got a couple of data in the last two years which showed nicely that even asymptomatic AF patients with short episodes will profit from um, sinus rhythm. Um, I will show this um, in my presentation later and um, and what do I mean with uh, benefit or beneficial of sinus rhythm in patients with asymptomatic AF? I mean um, cardiovascular comorbidities or complications in the future 
and um, tachymyopathy is everything because um, short episodes asymptomatic, these patients won't uh, feel it. So, with other words, um, if someone has AF, 30 seconds, I wouldn't go for ablation in this patient, but I would uh, tell the patient, okay, this is something we have to treat and which can be a problem in the near future, and I would look for the Chet's vascular and I would go talk with the patient what he wants, because once they have, always they have. After the first episode, the second, and the episodes will come shorter and shorter. Regarding this uh, th th uh, AF etiologies, it's a thyroid assessment also very important for our general practitioners. Because last month I have on patients with AF fast ventricular rate found to have a hyperthyroidism. Just initial presentation itself will, uh, will be uh, AF in hyperthyroidism. And uh, regarding the starting the treatment for AF, sometimes they will have mild symptoms with AF. After starting the treatment, with the rate control or rhythm control. So sometimes some people who had a tachybrady syndrome, they will land up in syncope. So more than this AF, the drugs reveal the underlying sick sinus syndrome. That's also very important for a diagnostic aspects. I think there's something in the context of remote monitoring. Today in the COVID times, we talk about remote monitoring. And I think, Lord, as, as Dr. Thomas has mentioned, the devices have given us a lot of information on the F burden in, in the population. But then there's an interesting study which has shown that, you know, the, may, some of them, they, you know, when, once you pick this up and then they are I mean, prompted to go to the hospital and aggressive treatment has actually led to I mean, worse outcomes. So I think there's a trade-off there. So I think we also need to look into that aspect. Of course, there's not a large, large data, maybe a few hundred patients studied from the, all the remote monitoring from the devices. And so that's, that's another thing which you also need to keep in mind. So all AFs, you know, even sometimes very aggressive, I don't know. Uh, that's also has a negative effect sometimes. Your, your comments on that? No, for sure. Um, aggressive treatment is always not good. Um, um, the, the study you mentioned uh, is a very interesting study indeed. And um, Honestly, I would um, um, agree 100% on that. So, um, at the end of the day, and this is what I deeply believe, the patient decides. The patient decides what he wants. If he want, wants to be treated, we can consult, but the patient has to decide. And if he wants to be treated, we have to treat him, even he, if he's asymptomatic and if it's a short episode. And, um, and we counsel him, and if, he, if the patient say, okay, I don't want this anymore in my life, um, we can say, okay, go for antiarrhythmic treatment, just for example, you will have a recurrence rate of 70%, or go for an ablation treatment, you will have a recurrence rate of 30%. So, the, uh, I agree, aggressive treatment is not good, but at the end of the day, the patient has to decide, and uh, this should be the, the most best way, into, uh, from my opinion. Uh, sir, uh, uh, in our country, the prevalence of the said uh, chronic permanent AF is very high. Do you think still a shot of uh, an ablation will change the course of disease, or do you think, uh, uh, what do you say? I think uh, we still have reasonably uh, high numbers of patients with valvular disease. So I think uh, a lot of our chronic AFs could still be uh, valvular AF, and I think we shouldn't forget that. Uh, in terms of... Uh, of Non-valvular. Non yeah. So, so the question is really, uh, I think as more and more facilities come in terms of uh, ability to ablate these, uh, these patients, I think... Many of uh, our patients who have a label of chronic AF will probably become uh, be relabeled as uh, uh, as, as per uh, persistent AF, and I think many of the uh, as newer generations of EP uh, uh, cardiologists come into practice, I think we will be seeing uh, a lot of these patients uh, uh, at least being attempted to to convert to sinus rhythm. 
I think one other point that maybe you would like to touch on is, is one of the commonest drugs that is used, whether it's for rate or for rhythm control in this country, is amhydrone. And I think the use, uh, maybe you, you, you need to touch on this because I see so many of our patients coming back, you know, or, or coming to us first time. It's only, only rhythm, I mean, it's only rate control that is being attempted, but they're on amhydrone. And uh, uh, this is something maybe you need to talk about. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, this is indeed a very, very important uh, point. If you ask me, amidron is poison. Uh, it's a good drug, but it's poison. Um, we are living in the year 2021. You have now the console here. And there are, we have so many options to treat a patient. If you decide to go for rate control, why do you give him amidron? This does not make any sense. You destroy the, the lung, the eyes, the, the thyroid, all these organs. This does not make any sense. Give him beta blocker, give him digitalis, and go for rate control. If you want to do a, a, a rhythm control, we have other options. The main problem with amiron is indeed that um, the side effects will come at the end and that the compliance of the patients is not good. And from my personal experience is if you start with amiron too early with these patients, you mentioned after the first episode, you lose a, you lose a good option for the future once the patient will get older. And there you cannot give him any more flecainide or all the other drugs. And he already has problems with the thyroid or with his lungs and so on. And you already... Um, uh, the patient was already in amiodarone, and it, was, it is right now ineffective. So what is left? What can you do then? Then you can go only for a pacing blade, destroy the AV node and give him a pacemaker. So um, uh, amiodarone is a good drug, but we have to um, give it in an intelligent way to the patient, and that's what I what I think is the best.